let's look at some movement in and out of the cell. Now let's talk a minute about ATP powered transporters. You're going to be talking about proteins found in the cell membrane which are burning up ATP to move something. And often they're doing that to move something against diffusion. You're going to see how diffusion works here in just a second. But ATP is definitely used to power materials, at least the movement of them. So whenever the cell wants to move something against concentration gradients, often these ATP-powered pumps are being used. What that means is these proteins are burning up ATP to move something. you got to remember ATP is the fuel of the cells, just like gas for an engine. So they always require ATP, and again, you're going to see they're generally going against diffusion. All right, we'll take a look at that here again in just a second. The rate of transport depends on a couple of things, like the concentrations of the substrate. The more material you have available that needs to be moved, the quicker you can move it, and the more ATP you have available, the quicker you can move it. And the best example of active transport, which is what ATP power transport is, the best example is the sodium potassium exchange pump. So anytime you hear about active transport, think about a protein in that cell membrane burning up ATP to move something. And this sodium potassium pump is very common throughout cells in different places for different reasons. And the cell membrane is something like a neuron or a muscle cell. It's largely responsible for setting up resting membrane potentials. When you get to the kidneys, you'll see that practically all movement of material is dependent on it. But every time this little protein here were to burn up an ATP, it pumps three sodium out of the cell and two potassium in. So you look at resting membrane potentials, that's how the sodium got on the outside and how the potassium got on the inside is through the use of these little powered pumps. We'll mention receptor proteins. These little receptor proteins in cell membranes are there to identify and interact with many different chemical signals of the body. So they'll generally have an exposed receptor site on the outside of the cell. And when a chemical comes along, remember things like ligands are general terms for chemicals inside the body. There are many different forms of ligands. Look at something like a hormone. You've probably heard of those before. When hormones work on the body, they know exactly where to work because there's only some cells that'll have the receptor sites for them. There's something like 200 cell types in the human body. If only one of those 200 types of cells in us has a specific protein that's receptive to that particular chemical, that's the only place it can work. When hormones go in the blood, they go practically everywhere, but that doesn't mean they're going to work everywhere. Only one cell type has the protein receptor that it can bind to and interact with, then that's the only cell that that chemical can cause a change in. When you look at all these little receptor links, a lot of those are going to be ion channels. Again, ion channels, like little passageways for ions. You'll see them for other molecules too. But again, as we mentioned in a previous video, some of them are non-gated, but many of them do have gates. And chemical signals and electric signals are what cause those gates to open and close. Again, cells can communicate with electric and chemical signals. And a good example of where that happens is the chemical acetylcholine binding to some ligand-gated sodium channels on skeletal muscle. You'll see that in the future in, say, Chapter 9, which deals more with skeletal muscle. But if you want that skeletal muscle to contract, you can use a motor neuron to release a chemical acetylcholine. It'll bind to these sodium ligand-gated sodium channels. When they open up, sodium comes in, the electric charges swap, and that's when electric signals are generated. And that's going to allow that muscle to contract. So we're going to see these channels opening and closing. Usually they're going to open in response to a chemical signal. And sometimes some of these little protein channels may not work correctly. In the case of cystic fibrosis, that's what happens. This is specifically a defect in the chloride channels of the body. And it's seen in particular places in abundance in epithelial cells, which are called goblet cells, in the air passageways of the respiratory system. Now, you'll see in a future chapter that when cells want to move water, they pump sodium first. And where sodium goes, chloride follows it, and then the water follows them. That's why sweat is salty, because that water is following that sodium and chloride. But if somebody has cystic fibrosis, the chloride channels don't work. So what happens when the sodium is pumped and moved, the chloride doesn't. And if you only move one of those two solutes, you won't move as enough water, and that will cause a very thick mucus to build up in the air passageways, and that can be deadly. 
We'll also see lots of different drugs interacting with these little channels and such in different places and different chapters also. G-protein complexes are another place that chemical signals can work in the body. If you see a picture of these G-protein complexes, you'll look at the cell membrane, and you'll see this integral protein, which remembers a protein goes all the way through the cell membrane, and it'll have these three little subunits, these three little pieces in the intracellular environment. And whenever a chemical binds to this G-protein complex, you'll always see this third, this last subunit, called the alpha subunit, separate. And it's going to do one of two things. It'll either bind to an ion channel and open its gates and let an ion pour into the cell, or it'll activate an enzyme. <clears throat> so when you see how different proteins are working to cause things like smooth muscle contraction or whatever, you'll see a lot more of this in future chapters. And if anything interacts and uh, activates an enzyme, whatever that may be, enzymes are always going to lower activation energy and speed up chemical reactions. Chemical reactions do not occur fast enough naturally to sustain life. So these enzymes are very important to speeding up those chemical reactions or we wouldn't have life as we know it. Let's also talk a little about movement through the plasma membrane. Now we'll look at diffusion and osmosis in this uh, little video here. We'll look at filtration and other transport mechanisms in the next one. But looking at this diffusion osmosis, we start with diffusion. Diffusion is nothing more than the movement of any type of material from an area of high to low concentration. Due to the random motion of atoms, right? Atoms in our body, cells, whatever, are always going to be in motion. So as they're in motion, they collide with each other. And if they collide with each other, they will move away from each other. That's all that diffusion is. The cell does not have to do anything in particular. You just put a bunch of material in one place, they'll bump into each other, and they'll move away from each other. And if you look at an example of where this is important in the body, think about the respiratory system. We draw air into our lungs so that we can get oxygen into our blood. There'll be more oxygen in that air and less in our blood, so it diffuses into the blood. It's just moving from high to low concentration. Now, carbon dioxide goes in the opposite direction, still going from high to low, but there'll be more of it in the blood, less in the air, so that's why it comes out of the blood. So we get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Everything's just moving from high to low concentration. And there are many things that affect diffusion, like smaller molecules tend to diffuse faster. And if you have a very high concentration of materials in one area, they bump into each other, move away faster versus a low concentration. And also temperature, with a higher temperature, diffusion tends to occur faster too. So we'll see where concentration, density gradients make a difference. The greater the difference in two materials, say you got a little membrane, there's a much greater concentration on one side, less on the other. Again, it's going to go from high to low. And the bigger the difference in those concentrations, the faster diffusion is going to work. Look at something like oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you were to take more and more oxygen into your lungs, you get more of it into the blood. <clears throat> the bigger the difference of it, the quantity in one side of the membrane and the other, the quicker diffusion is going to occur. But looking at osmosis here, this is the diffusion of water. So this is water moving from an area of high to low concentration. Water moves from where there's more of it to where there's less of it, just like other things do. But you got to remember what that water will be doing is moving towards the higher concentration of solutes. Now, the reason being, wherever there's more solutes, there's less water. So that water is still moving from high to low concentration. And water is always the solvent in the human body. Look at any living cell in a tissue in the interstitial spaces or whatever. Water is the stuff that all other things are dissolved in. So solutes are all these things dissolved in the water. We don't have pure water anywhere in the body. That water solvent will always have solutes in it. We'll see the movement of it across cell membranes in many places throughout the chapters. So water's always going from where there's more water to where there's less water. It's always going to be going towards the greater concentration of solutes. Again, if you think about how sweat is moved onto your skin when you get hot, what the cells do is that they don't have water pumps, but they have lots of sodium pumps. And when that sodium is pumped, the chloride follows it, and the water's following the solutes. Again, that's the point. Water will be following those solutes. That's how the cells get water moved. 
So when you look at osmotic pressure here, that's going to be the force required to prevent water movement across a membrane by osmosis. We'll see that in a few places further along too. But look at some terms that go along with osmosis right here. Look at the first one, isoosmotic. Here's where you've got solutions with the same concentration of solutes on either side of a membrane. So say this is a cell. Maybe it's like one red blood cell, or it doesn't matter what it is in the body. And you put it into a container here. And the numbers are just very low and simple, just to show what the solute concentrations are. You'll see in tissues of the body, these numbers are generally 300 milliosmoles. But let's just use simple numbers to keep this simple in this example. So let's say the solute concentration inside the cell is one, and the solute concentration in the fluid material around it is one. Well, there they're equal. That's isoosmotic, equal concentrations of solutes. Look at hyperosmotic, where a solution has a greater concentration of solutes. So again, let's say the cell still has a concentration of solutes of one, but now the material around it has a concentration of two. Since there's more in that material, that solution around it, you could call that a hyperosmotic. Remember, hyper means more than. This material out here has a greater concentration than what that inside the cell does. But look at the opposite, hypoosmotic, where there's a lower concentration of solutes. So now look what we've got, concentration of two inside the cell and one around it. So again, now there's less around the cell. You could say that solution is hypoosmotic to compare to what's inside the cell, which is hyper, since it has more. And something that goes right along with that right there again is water movement. Water's going to go towards the solute. So again, if we go back to our first little container with this cell in it, if that's an isotonic solution, the concentration of solutes is equal. Well, technically, water's moving in both directions, but in equal amounts. There'll be no change in the size of that cell. There's no net movement of water in or out of the cell that's greater. But let's say you put a cell into a hypertonic solution. Remember, that means the solution around the cell, hyper, has more solutes and water moves towards the solutes. Water will move out of that cell at that time. And that shrinking of the cell caused by water loss is what crenation is. But look lastly right here at a hypotonic solution. Now a cell's been placed into a solution, a container of fluid material, which is hypo, has fewer solutes. So if the solution around it has fewer solutes, then the cell on the inside has more. It's hyper compared to the outside, which is hypo. And if there's a greater concentration of solutes inside that cell, water's going to move into the cell, going towards the greater concentration of those solutes. And that cell will continue to swell with water, and it can pop and rupture, which is what the lysing of a cell is. Put any cell in your body into a pure water solution, and that's exactly what would happen. So we'll see a lot more on this in water movement when it comes to different chapters in different places.